Good morning and welcome to the Gospel of this morning. We are in the Book of Acts and we're coming to the second part of the second part. Last time we saw how Jesus was lifted up from the Mount of Olives and the Apostles being left behind. This time we are going to read from verses 10 and 11 Acts chapter 1. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Well, the first subtitle then, Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. The unreal was not quite finished yet. In their consternation, gazing up into heaven, they were spoken to by two heavenly creatures in white apparel. They must have been two angels who brought a measure of comfort to them without telling them that at least another 2,000 years would go by until their words would become true. Why stand ye gazing up into heaven, they said. The same Jesus shall come, the same way. No other Jesus, the same Jesus will come in a similar manner out of heaven to earth again. Now from the Bible we have a more dramatic picture of his coming. But then thousands of his saints and angels riding on a white horse. Almost every generation since that day has looked up and expected him to come any moment, saying it cannot become worse. And, and, and Jesus has tarried even until today, 2,000 years later. We, we have a great hype in the churches today, 2024. 20, prophets are arising everywhere, pointing to the Middle East and the sounds of war ignoring the words of Jesus in verse 7. It, it is not for you to know. No, no, they, they say, we, we do not give the hour or the day. We, we just point to the signs of the season. The season is already two millennia old. It seems to be more important to discern the times than to prepare for it. Now, and then verses 12 to 14, then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day journey, and they went, and when they were come in, they went up into an upper room, where about Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Selots and Judas, brother of James. Well, they returned unto Jerusalem, is our subtitle. They did not get scattered, each one turning to his own side. They, they did what Jesus had commanded them to do. They returned to Jerusalem. It also gives us an indication from where they had come, namely from the Mount of Olives. And we now even know how far from Jerusalem it was, a Sabbath day journey. They, they went to the famous upper room where we have the 11 remaining apostles mentioned, then a number of unnamed women and Mary, the mother of Jesus. Added to them were the brothers of Jesus, who by this time were believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, these all continued with one accord. They had no idea what to do there. And they did what was the right thing to do. They prayed and made supplication to the Lord. From what had happened on the day before Jesus' crucifixion and the words that he had spoken to them, they could presume that the Lord was now in heaven, sitting at the right hand of the Father glorified, to pray was the most natural thing to do if, if they wanted to be in contact with Jesus. And, and this is what they did. 
but there was still something lacking. There were only 11 apostles of the Lamb. And then we begin to read in verses 15 to 17, and in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of them were about 120 men and brethren. The scriptures must need to be fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of, mouth of David spoke before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Now, in those days Peter stood up. We, we have here 120 followers of Jesus gathered together in the upper room. 120 souls without a shepherd. They desperately needed some leadership. And Peter, well, surely inspired by the Spirit of God, stood up and took the helm firmly in hand. And he did it with scripture using Psalm 41. Verse 9, verse 9, it says, Behold, the hope of him is in vain. Shall not one be cast down even at the sight of him? Well, then Peter reminds them of what Judas had done. Verse 18 and 19, Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers of Jerusalem, insomuch as that field is called in their proper tongue, Akeldama, that is to say, the field of blood. This man purchased the field with the reward of iniquity, it says. Luke reminds us of the story of Judas Iscariot who betrayed Jesus with a kiss and sold him out for 30 pieces of silver. We read something about this in Zechariah chapter 11 and verse 12. And I said unto them, if you think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, cast it Unto the potter, a goodly price that I was prized at of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Hmm. Falling headlong, he burst asunder. Well, in another place, it says that Judas hanged himself. He paid with his life for the iniquity he had committed. Why we have two different accounts of how Judas' death is described has been debated. Some say that he had hanged himself and then he was cut down from the tree and he fell headlong and burst open. Well, after Judas had brought the money back to those who gave it to him, they could not put it back into the treasury as it was blood money. They took the 30 pieces of silver and bought a field from the potter as a graveyard for foreigners and named it the field of blood. And then we come to verses 20 to 22. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate and let no man dwell therein. And his bishopry let another take. Therefore, of these men, which have companied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus was with us, going in and out among us, being from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. Well, for it is written in Psalms, well, Psalm 69, verse 25, and 109, verse 8. All things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ has been documented as prophetic utterances in the Old Testament. Eleven apostles could only partially fulfill what God had purpose for all twelve. They are in the millennium going to be the twelve judges over the whole house of Israel. 
But Judas, having been dismissed, had to be replaced. And Peter reminded the others that there was an empty chair to be filled. In God's plan, nothing is to be left out and everything to the last detail is going to be fulfilled. We often ask ourselves, where, where is our freedom to choose? No, we are free to choose God or reject him. We, if we are for him, will be part of his eternal purposes. Election is always limited to purpose and not to a person in the first instance because God does not respect the person but gives us all an equal chance to respond to his calling. And here, a man had to be chosen to fulfill the gap where Judas left off. Peter set out some conditions and standards. He had to have been with Jesus from his baptism until his ascension. This man's initial calling would be to be a witness to the Lord's resurrection. No special witnesses were needed to testify of the three and a half years of Jesus' miracle working. Uh, everybody knew it. Even his enemies had to admit to it in their hearts. The apostles' great witness from the beginning of their ministry was the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, this made him the true son of God. It is this fact that irritates the unbeliever. Well, until this far today, until next time, God bless you. Amen.